live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. When a coach asks a player if he's ready to go into a game, while it's technically a yes or no question, it's a question that only has one right answer. Barring I can't go in because I'm injured, you pretty much have to say yes, and it makes sense why everyone would say yes to this. Why wouldn't a player on an NFL team want to play in an NFL game? I'm not sure any coach is going to be too responsive to a player saying, I don't really want to go into the game. That's a surefire way to get your playing time reduced, getting on your coach's bad side, or getting released from the team altogether. Yet in a 1978 game between the Cleveland Browns and New York Jets, as overtime was about to start and head coach Sam Rutigliano asked one of his players to go back there for the kickoff, that's exactly what happened. The player in question said he didn't want to go out there, and Rutigliano said that was fine and didn't initially send him out. 30 seconds later, that same player was out there on the field and won his team the game. It was one of the fastest 0 to 100 stories you're ever going to see. And this is the story behind the kickoff and what has to be the most surprising kickoff in the over 75-year history of the Browns franchise. Before I talk about the kickoff and the player involved, we need some context to understand what was happening in the game beforehand, and just how important this game was. Let's start with the home team of the Cleveland Browns. Under new head coach Sam Rutigliano, it seemed like things were off to a good start, and were going way better than they were in 1977, when their season ended in disaster after Forrest Gregg got replaced midway through the season. If you want to learn more about that controversy, then click the card in the upper right corner. Cleveland started 3-0 to the surprise of just about everyone, and looked like worthy contenders for the AFC Central crown alongside the Pittsburgh Steelers. However, they came back down to earth after that, dropping 7 of their next 11 games. What looked like it could be a promising season became a fairly mediocre one, as entering this game, the Browns were at 500 and out of the playoff picture. The same could not be said about the New York Jets, though. Much like the Browns, no one really expected anything of the Jets in 1978. They hadn't had a winning record since the merger, and were an abysmal 3-11 the year before. However, unlike the Browns, entering Week 15, they actually had a shot at the postseason. They entered this game at 8-6, having won 6 of their last 9 games. While they were still a game back in the final wildcard spot, and would need to win out and get some help along the way, they were still mathematically alive, thanks to an offense that had scored 318 points, which was the 4th highest total in the league. Walt Michaels had this team going in the right direction. And for the first time in the 70s, if you were a Jets fan, you actually had some hope. Thanks in part to the play of their second-year receiver Wesley Walker, who led the league in receiving yards that season and might have been the best receiver in football. With that, we head to Cleveland Municipal Stadium for this Week 15 matchup on a cold December day in Cleveland. Vegas had this one as a toss-up, and it was clear from the onset that the weather was going to be brutal. With winds of over 19 miles an hour, when kickoff took place, the teams were dealing with a wind chill factor of zero. If the Browns win, they clinch a non-losing season. But more importantly for the Jets, this game could completely decide their season. Win, and your playoff hopes remain intact. Lose, and your season is over. We know the stakes, we know what's on the line. And now it's time to play some football. There were 208 games played during the expanded 1978 season. You could make the argument that even though it didn't matter in the grand scheme of things, that this one between the Browns and the Jets might have been the best one of them all. Early on, it looked like the Browns were going to be in complete control of the contest, following a 2-yard touchdown run by Calvin Hill in the first quarter, and a 22-yard touchdown pass by Brian Seif to Greg Pruitt to open up the second quarter, Cleveland held a 14-0 lead. After the Jets cut it to a 17-10 game at the halftime break, it seemed like that was going to be as close as the Jets would get all day, because following a 22-yard field goal by Don Cockroft and a 2-yard run by Brian Seif, the Browns held a 27-10 lead entering the fourth quarter. In their over 30-year history at this point, only once had the Browns ever blown a 17-point lead, which was in a 1955 game against the Eagles, and in that one, the Browns only led by one entering the fourth. And in their near 20-year history, the Jets had never come back from down 17 entering the fourth quarter. So on paper, this one was all but over. Time for the Jets to pull a rabbit out of their hat. Earlier in the season against the Denver Broncos, the Jets were down 28-7 at one point in the second quarter, and won the game 31-28. It was the largest comeback in franchise history. But a month later, considering that there were only 9 minutes left in the game, they were on the verge of pulling off something bigger. A 4-yard touchdown pass from Matt Robinson to Mickey Schuler made a 27-17. A 20-yard touchdown pass from Robinson to Bruce Harper, which was Harper's second touchdown of the day, made it 27-24. Follow that up with a Pat Leahy field goal from 39 yards out, and all of a sudden, for the first time all day, the game was tied. And to cap it all off, when Kevin Long ran it into the end zone from a yard out, it gave the Jets a shocking 34-27 lead with 1-11 left. 
The Jets, who had scored 10 points in the first 50 minutes, scored 24 in the ensuing eight and took the lead. It was an absolutely remarkable comeback that could have put them into the postseason. But there's a reason you don't hear Jets fans talking about this one in the same vein that they talk about the Monday Night Miracle in 2000 against the Dolphins. And that's because they couldn't close it off. Even though there was only 1-11 left in the game, and even though the Browns needed to drive the length of the field just to tie it up, that's exactly what happened. After a few plays to get into the red zone, when Sight hit Calvin Hill on an 18-yard strike with less than 30 seconds left, we were all tied up. It was a true back-and-forth contest that no one saw coming. And with a game as good as this, it always seems fitting that we play a fifth quarter and play some overtime. The Browns were going to receive. And prior to the opening kickoff of the OT period, things got very, very weird. Running back Reg Pruitt was a fantastic player. He had made the Pro Bowl in four of the previous five seasons, had run for at least a thousand yards in each of the past three seasons, and at this point had crossed the thousand yard from scrimmage mark for the fourth straight year. And everyone knew how good he was, including the Jets. He finished this game with 138 rushing yards, a very nice 69 receiving yards, and had a touchdown in the second quarter. Anytime you finish a game with over 200 yards from scrimmage, you had a heck of a day. And this game might have been one of the best of Pruitt's storied career. There's just one small problem. Pruitt hadn't returned to kick all season. At this point in the game, the Jets had kicked the ball off six times to the Browns. The two return men were fifth round rookie Kevin Wright and third round rookie Larry Collins. Both of those guys were the primary kick returners for the Browns all season. By the time the season ended, Collins and Wright, who each had 30 returns, were the only players on the team with more than four returns. Pruitt had a grand total of zero returns. He had zero returns in 1977. The last time he returned to kick was all the way back on October 10, 1976, in an 18-16 victory against the Pittsburgh Steelers. It had been 792 days since Pruitt was a kick returner. Which is why when Rutigliano came up to Pruitt and asked him if he wanted to go into the game as the return man to start off overtime, Pruitt said no. Rutigliano wanted to try something different, since Collins and Wright weren't doing a whole lot. The two men averaged just 19 yards per return. He thought that Pruitt could provide a spark, but Pruitt did not want to go in there. He had virtually no experience returning kicks in recent years, didn't feel comfortable doing this, especially in sub-zero temperatures, and didn't want to be the reason why his team lost in overtime. Rutigliano heard what Pruitt had to say and said, okay. He didn't hold a grudge against Pruitt, and it would be tough to hold a grudge against a guy with over 200 scrimmage yards in this game. It was a completely valid reason, as Pruitt just didn't want to play out of position with so much on the line. But then, Pruitt changed his mind. As Rutigliano was sending the kick return unit out onto the field, Pruitt came up to him and after thinking about it, said that he would do it. He wanted to be out there to start off the overtime period. With that, the Browns made the switch and Pruitt got out there. What happened next is, considering the circumstances, one of the most surprising things that has happened on a football field for the Browns. When overtime started, the Jets were kicking off to the Browns, and back there for Cleveland was Greg Pruitt, the return man who didn't really want to be out there in the first place and didn't feel comfortable as a return man. Sure enough, Jets kicker Pat Leahy kicked it off short, and the ball came straight to Pruitt. The end result? After Pruitt runs up to get it, he's off to the races. He sprints up the middle, breaks a tackle, stays upright as a ton of Jets try to bring him down, and makes it all the way past midfield on a 31-yard return, setting the Cleveland crowd into an absolute frenzy. For a guy who wanted nothing to do with returning this kick, he did a heck of a job. Because of this return, the Browns were starting the drive in Jets territory, only needing three points to get the win. And at this point in overtime, the plan was simple. Give the ball to the hot hand. Give the ball to Pruitt. Every time Pruitt touched the ball, he made magic happen. Five yards here, 13 yards there, and 26 yards over there. Pruitt was an absolute workhorse that simply would not go down and would not succumb to the Jets' defense. After his runs got the ball to the five-yard line, Cockroft did the rest, as he hit the chip shot 22-yard field goal and gave the Browns an absolutely wild win in overtime. After the game, all the talk was about the overtime period and that kickoff return by Pruitt. As Pruitt said afterwards on what took place on the sidelines, Sam asked me to return the overtime kickoff, and at first I said no. There was so much riding on it, and I hadn't run back a kickoff all season. He said that was okay, but then I thought about it and said, I'll do it. We were running a middle return, and when you're doing that, the best thing that can happen to you is a short kick. And I almost broke it. Rutigliano was in a pretty happy mood after the win as well, and said on the talk with Pruitt on the sideline prior to the start of overtime, with the bases loaded and a chance to use your designated hitter, well, you use him. But we had to renegotiate his salary on the sidelines. As for what happened after the game, this story might not have the ending that you'd expect. 
Despite how great this game was, entering Week 16, neither the Browns nor the Jets had anything to play for. In fact, both teams got absolutely clobbered in the regular season finale. The Browns took on their in-state rival in the Cincinnati Bengals, a team that started the season off 1-12 looking like the worst team in football, though was ending their season on a shockingly high note, having won two straight entering this one. And not only did the Bengals make it three in a row, but they did so in a convincing fashion, winning 48-16, which was the most points they put up in a game since their 1972 regular season finale against the Houston Oilers. As for the Jets, they took on the defending Super Bowl champion Dallas Cowboys, and Walt Michaels had the genius idea of calling the Cowboys a stupid team that didn't have any heart whatsoever. Unsurprisingly, it didn't work, as the Cowboys clobbered the Jets 30-7. If you want to learn more about that abomination of a game and some of the stupidest coaching in Jets history imaginable, and that's saying a lot, then click the card in the upper right corner. As for Pruitt, what would his future look like returning kicks? Despite this amazing return, that would not be in his future with the Browns, as very few teams put their starting running back on special teams. Pruitt only returned one kick with the Browns in 1979, no kicks in 1980, and three kicks in 1981. Even though Pruitt had returned some kicks at the start of his career, by this point, those days were done. However, once he found himself on the Los Angeles Raiders in 1982, he would make a more considerable impact on special teams, and return kicks and punts for his three seasons there. In fact, in 1983, he even made it to the Pro Bowl after leading the league in punt return yards, averaging 11.5 yards per punt return. Pruitt wouldn't play in the NFL again after that 1984 season, meaning that he spent 12 years in the NFL. For any running back to do that, and play 12 seasons in the league while making 5 Pro Bowls and winning a Super Bowl when he won Super Bowl 18 with the Raiders, that is a heck of a career. But of all the plays that Pruitt made in his career, from his 1,200 rushes to his 328 receptions, perhaps the best and most notable play was this one against the Jets in 1978. He got an opportunity that he never thought he would get and was not expecting at all and he made the most of it after some second thought. The best play of his career might have been the play that he never wanted to make in the first place. Get your official Jaguar Gary 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jrgator9, and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so yeah, how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.